Hi, everyone, and welcome to the final episode of our Ref6 Euro special. I'm joined by uh, my co-host, John, as always, and our special guest uh, throughout this Euros, uh, former FIFA assistant referee, Phil Sharp. Um, we were hoping that this uh, would be a little bit more uh, celebratory podcast, but unfortunately, it didn't come home. It went to Rome. Um, and yeah, we're, we're going to touch on, as we have done throughout the series, a few of the incidents that happened in the final. Um, we're going to cover the um, best kind of referee incidents from the whole tournament, um, uh, our top three, and we're just going to have a chit chat. So uh, firstly, guys, um, I'm devastated, but I'm also super proud of um, getting to the final. I've never seen England in a final. I touched on that in the last episode. Um, in truth, I always go into a tournament thinking we can do something. I, I don't think I've never, I've always felt we've always had the players, but for some reason or, or, or another, it's never come off. And if I look back over the last, since 96, which was really the first tournament I remember, which kind of gave me a false hope, um, we've not really done very well. So, you know, I'm super proud. But Phil, what, what are your thoughts overall on this England team um, this summer, the Euros, Gareth Southgate, a lot of the conversations that are happening by pundits? Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, first and foremost, really proud. Um, the team brought the country together, especially, you know, coming through the pandemic. Um and I, I think that, you know, there was that that hope that, that maybe we could win it. And I always said before the final, it's going to go one or two ways. If we win, it's going to be ecstatic. But if we don't win, you know, this could be really like a downer on everybody. And I, I think it has. And even worse than that, some of the negativity that's come out of it, which is just shocking. Um, I don't really want to spend too much time on that because, you know, you know, we, we ought to praise the team and, and what they achieved. But, uh, you know, over a month ago, would we have thought we'd been in the final? I don't know. We would have hoped so. So why didn't we celebrate that? Yeah. So, uh, you, you know, they did their best and it wasn't to be. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, yeah, obviously we condemn everything that's happened since, especially the social media uh, post and some of the kind of graffiti that's happened on you know Marcus Rashford's memorial but then actually you know coming out of all of that you see you know the tons of positive messages that are happening mm. and you know so it you know hate won't stop us it, it's being kind of hopefully driven out there is it still exists and that's been seen but um hopefully you know more and more can be done to squash squash it and change I don't know if changing minds is the right thing, but at, at least kind of removing it from the game. But let, let's let's more focus. John, what about yourself? You watched it with a group of friends, all referees. Um, how was your experience watching England in a final? Um, it was class. I had a great day. I've had a great month. You know, like I sent you a video of me celebrating with my mates, like the memories that last a lifetime. I am heartbroken. Monday was a tough day for me. Like, really tough. I've been through finals of Liverpool before and I don't think I've ever been so, like, heartbroken as I was with England because, you know, like, everyone wanted us to win. Like, there was no club rivalry or nothing. So I was was genuinely heartbroken. Um, but I've had a great month and we've got 18 months to do it all again. In 18 yeah. months' time, we'll do it all again. And I can't oh, wait please. to get my hopes up again. <laughs> It'll be super exciting. The one thing... Just on England, uh, I want to say is I think there's been a lot of talk about Gareth Southgate, his tactics, etc. His tactics got us to the final and they got us within, you know, a couple of kicks, you know, that, you know, we, we hit the post in the penalties, a couple of good saves, but they made the same amount of saves as we did in the penalty shootout. It was just Marcus Rashford who, missed, uh, who hit the post, right? So we were so close. We, we were within a couple of kicks of this completely being opposite, right? So I, I don't think you can you know, you can analyse the games and you can say, well, what if this happened or that happened? But realistically, we were only a couple of kicks away from it completely being different, right? And I think we took them all the way. Um, the one thing I will say is I think he's a, an incredible leader. Um, everything that he's done throughout the tournament in terms of his communication to at least what we've seen to the players, but also to the media has been fantastic. And I, I just look at him in awe as a leader and, you know, look at 
things that I can take into my role as a, a leader in a business. So um, fantastic. Probably, you know what, I'm, I'm throwing this out there. It might be the best manager that we've had in terms of the culture he's built in comparison to previous tournaments. I feel like all those players wanted to work for him, et cetera. But that's my view. We're not going to focus too much on, on England. We're going to focus on the, the Dutch referee team. There was the Dutch referee team. There was a Spanish fourth official and fifth official, a couple of Dutch um, VAR, AR, AVARs and a, a German VAR. So um, a mixture of different uh, nationalities in the refereeing team, but led by the Dutch referee Bjorn Kuypers. We thought it was a great appointment. And um, overall, just as a quick like headline, Phil, performance-wise, what did you think overall? In this yeah, o- o- overall, I, th- I thought he did well. Um, there's probably two incidents that we're going to touch on in this podcast, um, yeah. which is open for debate. One of those potentially a red card offence. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other one is debatable but um you know when we think about howard webb doing the world cup final and the one thing that everybody remembers is the challenge that could have been a red card yeah um but as a match official um no one can ever take away from you the appointment yeah and you know that will always be with him um and i i thought the team refereed the game well um but i also thought there was a couple of things and going to the red card was did he not issue a red card because it was a final? Mm-hmm. And I think we're all human beings. And um, I, I think that if I gave one bit of advice to people about appointments to finals is that there's still a game of football. And if it needs a, a yellow card or a red card to be issued, then do it. Um, yeah. But we can talk about that in a minute. Yeah, no, sure. good. Yeah, no, I thought overall um, there was a big incent- uh, consent... Uh, a big kind of, I don't know what the right word is, and that's not great for a podcast, but um, a a tactic of the official to let the game flow as much as it could. And I think it's been, again, very consistent with other games where there was potentially a different referee could have given double the amount of fouls in this game if he wanted to. Um, I think he wanted to make sure that every foul he gave was almost what I would call a stone wall foul. There was a couple where... You know, they were light. The, the players maybe went down too easily. The, he just said, no, I'm not going to give those. And I think he set his stall out really early. John, what about you? And, and because you were with a group of referees, what was the overall consensus of the refereeing performance? Um, I thought from the start he was a bit unfairly treated by the media because obviously, I know it's a European final, but straight away the first thing the commentators said about Bjorn Carpers was about his net worth and who he is, you know, like, that he owns a supermarket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it wasn't really about how it got there. Like, they weren't talking about this is his ninth major final from under 17 World Cups to the Euros. It was, yeah. oh, he part owned or co founded Jumbo. And it wasn't anything to do about his football. So I've always been unfairly treated in that aspect. Um, but other than that, I thought he had a good game. Um, I have, like I say, questions about everything, uh, about that one challenge on Jack Grealish. Um, as an England mm-hmm. fan, I will. Um, but other than that, I thought, he dealt with it well. He's cool, calm and collected. Is it, I don't know, I haven't read into it, but is it true he's now retired from UEFA? No, no. So it was uh, an article in uh, the Dutch press, which basically asked him about his journey. And he said he's going to consider the next stage of his career. Um, he's going to speak to his family. The rest of his team want to want to stay on. And obviously the World Cup's 18 months away, um, depending on if they're going to take it seems unlikely that they might take two uh, sets of officials from one country for the World Cup, but you know, you never know. But um, if they did, then obviously, if they didn't, then obviously it's him versus Danny, who also had a fantastic tournament too, and is an up com- up and coming referee. And that will be a tough decision. Um, but yeah, he hasn't said he's retiring. He says he's considering what what's next. Um, so yeah, but you mentioned nine finals, so I think I've got them in front of me. Under-17 Euro Championship Final 2006, Under-21 Championship in 2009, UEFA Super Cup 2011, Brazil 2013, which I think is a Confederations Cup, Europa League Final 2013, Champions League Final 2014, uh, Korea um, 
I, again, I think Confederations Cup, maybe I need to double check that in 2017, Europa League final 2018. So he's done the Europa League final twice and now the Euro 2020 um, uh, final. <laughs> it's unreal. Phil, yeah. I thought you had a decorated career, but uh, this guy has been, you know, that those types of finals are, are, it's kind of like how we're saying, well, England have got to semi-finals and finals. Now we're starting to build a um, an experience base, which we can always look back on. He's got eight big finals there where he knows that he's good enough to do these games, even though this is probably almost without doubt the biggest game he's ever done. He's had some big ones in the past. So he probably, do you think he would have gone into that game with nerves or uh, confidence or both? No, definitely confidence. Um, it all depends. Individuals are different, aren't they? And even though you could be confident, part of your makeup might be that I'm nervous before. And mm -hmm. as soon as I walk out onto the field of play, that's when, you, you know, I, I call it putting on my match head. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm raring to go. Uh, but, you know, I think Dutch people are very self-confident mm -hmm. anyway. So they would have loved it, you know, they would have uh, loved the occasion and given it their best shot. So I, I don't think there would have been nerves, no. And, and you know what, the, it was completely celebrated in Holland amongst the refereeing community, the, the fact that they had a semi-final referee and a final referee. It was um, a lot of pride in, in, in the Netherlands for the referee. All fantastic. But we mentioned... You know, overall, I thought we had a great game um, and and let the game flow. But we mentioned there were two incidents that we wanted to chat about. And we're going in chronological order because um, probably the, the second one is the, the one that's more for a conversation. But the first one was in the 95th minute of six minutes of additional time. Um, or it may have been slightly earlier, but it was uh, Saka um, uh, received the ball on the right wing and was breaking away from play. Uh, attacking towards the goal but around the halfway line just inside the Italian half and um, he'd beaten Chiellini for pace um, and Chiellini decided to basically put his hand out and take the the, uh, the shirt around Saka's neck and pull him back and it was quite a uh, and it almost it basically that that pull took uh, Saka's feet away the, the guy was it was almost like a wrestling move um, and uh, Bjorn Kuypers gave a yellow card um, it stopped a promising attack. It was um, debated amongst the refereeing community. And this is where we've got to be careful because there's obviously referees who are English who are looking through with our white tinted glasses on um, versus other referees in different countries. But I have seen other referees in different countries also query, should or should this not have been a red card? Um, and I think if they are looking at red card, they, they were uh, looking at a violent conduct red card. So, um, Phil, I'm going to start with yourself um, just because, yeah, I'd love to I'd love to know your thoughts. I, I'm, I, I'll, I'll save mine till the end. I'll, I'll let you and then John go. OK. Yeah, it was really interesting because, uh, first of all, it's a deliberate act. Secondly, it wasn't a normal shirt pull. Yeah, it was the neck of the back of the shirt. And if it wasn't a yellow card, because at first I'm sort of going, it's at least yellow. If it is a red card, then what's the offence? Yeah, because uh, when we talk about is it violent conduct or serious foul play? Obviously, Saka had the ball, mm -hmm. um, but it, it wasn't violent in so much as that he didn't punch him or try to punch him. Yeah. But you could say, did he try to choke him? Yeah. Because the 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 action um, resulted, as you say, it almost stopped him in his tracks. And uh, it was one of those sort of moments where you go, what is that? Mm -hmm. it, it would be interesting, I think, that if that was to be clarified by the authorities, so that if anything like that were to happen in the par in the future, beg your pardon, then we know what to deal with it. Yeah. So let's just say if a person had long hair, Mm -hmm. and you grab them by the hair, I would say that that's violent conduct because you've, you've grabbed hold of that person. Yeah. And when we think about pushing, when players push and shove each other, if you push somebody in the chest or in the back, it's normally a yellow card. But if you push them in the face, 
or you grab them around the neck, then that's a red card offence. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but it's at least a yellow card, at yeah. least. But I'd like that is if it were to happen in the future, then then what do the authorities expect? What does it come under? Because I've not actually seen that before. And so I think what you're alluding to, just just based on the tone of how you said and the things you brought up is, yes, it was a yellow in law and that was correct and supportable in the current laws. But does it feel like it needs to be stronger than a yellow card? Is, is yeah, that's a good way of saying it. Yeah. yeah. What does football expect? We've said that a few times and, and that's, you know, it felt, obviously it brought up a lot of debate. Um, so yeah, John, what about you? Again, you, I'm drawing on you as an individual, but then also your crowd of people that were watching the game. Um, my thoughts on this are quite simple, actually. I think it's a yellow card. Law states it's a yellow card. I've got no real issue with it. People grab the shirts all the time. He, you know, I don't think he's deliberately gone for the back of his shirt or that neck thing so i think it'll be hard you just to try to grab him yeah i think he's trying to grab anything we've said this on the podcast before this is the issue i have fouls like that are punishable by a yellow card only and nothing else but fouls like that change the game do you know what i mean mm -hmm. that for chiellini could be a like, defining moment for italy like saka is quick going down that right hand side like that stops something massive like delaying a promising attack but it he was free so mm -hmm. Could we potentially introduce a law or a rule that says, you know, these kind of fouls, like we were saying, those professional trips and those easy yellow cards that players take that just wipe their ankles, the cynical ones. Can we do something like, well, it's not a red card, but it's cheating enough to be like a five minute sim bin so that you still get punished for doing yeah. these types of things. And I, we've said it before, and I, the more we talk about it, the more I like the idea because it will stop this sort of housing behaviour um and yeah i think that those moments do change the game and they're not quite it's one of those ones that it's harsh to send him off but a yellow is not enough too lenient too yeah, lenient because they know the, the the term that players and fans will say is they took he took one for the team right yeah. that's the, the 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 general saying and and i agree with you we've talked about it before i feel like that is a uh, something for consideration from IFAB and from lawmakers and, and all the people involved in football and maybe a potential trial in the future is, can you give the referee this third option, which is, we, we talk about this orange card, right? Um, maybe it's this orange card or, or it's just specifically designed at like, um, we, because we introduce SPAR, stopping a promising attack, right? Where even a careless foul um, but if it stops a promising attack, results in a yellow card. So this was kind of the downgrade of Dogzo, but you, you know what I mean? Even yeah. though it was a careless foul, people were getting away with it. So they introduced that, but it doesn't seem like it's going far, far enough. And the fact that, yeah, could there be this interim punishment? I think it's a really good question to ask. Go on, Phil. Yeah, yeah John, um, probably a couple of weeks ago, you used a word which I've just written down, and that's cynical. Yeah. yeah, And I think that cynical challenges, and by challenges, that could be a shirt pull or you trip somebody up or something like that. Cynical should be dealt with in this manner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because if, you, if you've only got a yellow card and you've only got a red card, you, you know, we've spoken again about 50% of referees would give yellow and some that were really feeling tough will give a red card. But I, I think that if, if we understood that anything cynical where you just think, as you've just said, Hassan, is uh, against the spirit yeah. of, the, of the game, then something ought to be done about that. Because um, that, was, that certainly fell under the cynical bracket. It was, I think, if I think right, rightly, it was almost going back to the Harry Wilson challenge, Wales, Denmark, where the player got sent off. We thought it was maybe a little bit harsh. But it was also in that cynical bracket, I would say. Exactly. Right? I yeah. feel like that's a really good, good one to look back on. And I, uh, yeah. So yeah, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe something for discussion. I, I'd love to hear what people who are watching or listening think. So definitely tweet us and let us know. But then we we'll move on on into extra time. Italy starting to dominate, um, and then there's a challenge in the middle of the park where Jorginho and Grealish come together. Um, 
they're looking to win the ball. Grealish is kind of on the floor sliding in to, to win the ball or block the ball. Jorginho actually wins the ball, but as he's kind of coming down onto the ball, his foot uh, lands um, with the studs facing the player on the on Grealish's kind of thigh, right? Um, in real time, I wasn't sure there was much in it. I just thought it was a foul. But then as they showed different uh, views and angles, I was like, okay, well, hold on a minute. He's, he's won the ball, but like we've seen in the past, it's what you do after that, right? He's he's kind of grazed the ball and it's gone into um, Grealish's um, thigh. The question I have is force. You know, is there enough force for it to be completely dangering Grealish? Um, but Kuipers went yellow. Um, and some people, a lot of English people have said red, um, but still around the world, there's different thoughts, yellow, red. So Phil, is this more of a, or is is this more of a red than uh, than Chiellini's? Well, it is currently, yeah. <laughs> in, in my opinion, yes. Um, it it was a challenge which endangered the opponent's safety. Mm-hmm. When you slide in, and obviously Grealish slid in, but his feet were more on the ground. Yeah. Uh, with uh, Jorginho, his his foot went over the top of the ball and then caught the player. Um, you might say, well, it wasn't deliberate, but we're we're not talking about that. We're talking about actions which you know endanger opponent's safety yeah. and um, I thought the referee was very close had a clear view of it and this is for me if if VAR could and not have an opinion of um, uh, you know clear and obvious error that this is right and wrong and I think that everybody would expect that to be a red card offence and, uh, uh, you know, we've seen other challenges, Sweden, Ukraine, where the referee issued yellow and then was told to check the monitor or be informed that it's a red card offence. And they did so. Yeah. And I just wonder if it's because it was the final that that didn't happen. But if it had, I thought that that would have shown a really strong message that um, we're here to get the right decisions. Yeah. So you're, you're 100% red for you? For me, yes. Awesome. John? I totally agree. I think, especially on this Euros podcast, we feel the amount of times we've seen that happen in terms of Ampadu, um, the Ukraine one that you pointed out where he's won the ball and still been sent off. Like Winning the ball shouldn't really be a consideration if it's dangerous. We spoke about it when I was last on about John Joe Shelby beat Herrera to the ball but still got sent off because his studs were showing. I feel like it's been very consistent all the way through. And this is the one inconsistency of all the red cards, in, in my personal opinion. Um, I can see why he went yellow in terms of like it's a big occasion. It's what the last 15 minutes of the game, try and manage it. But I still think it is a red card. Yeah, interesting. Because Grealish was basically uh, showing Kuipers, hey, look, look what's happened. And and even though Kuipers has probably already pulled the yellow card out by that time, it, it would must have got VAR thinking, right? VAR would have been saying, okay, maybe there's a little bit more than, than we're seeing here. Had a look and they've decided not to. So this kind of gets us into the whole clear and obvious um, question and debate because in my opinion, throughout the tournament, the bar has been really high. You know, unless the referees really made an error, a clear and obvious error, it's not been, you know, referred back to the referee, right? And we've, we've seen that occasion. We even mentioned, and this is just to make sure that no one thinks we're biased, we we believe Calvin Phillips should have got a red card against Germany because there was a very, not, it, it was a similar force in terms of the, the challenge that happened there. So this is, this is filled something that you want to discuss around, like, how do we define this clear and obvious error? Because even in itself, that's subjective. You've got to think, okay, Phil's given a yellow, but I'm watching it back. I think it's a red, but it could also be a yellow. You know what I mean? It's really hard to to judge my involvement. I guess that's what comes with the training and the, the, the development of the VAR role. But how, how do we define this better? Um, I, I don't know if we can, because uh, IFAB have determined that terminology What's interesting is that there's not one operative 
for VAR. There's the main person, yeah. you, you've got a second person and you've got um, an assistant referee VAR. Yeah. And I just wonder if it was a bit like an appeals panel where you have three people yeah. and you all have a vote. <laughs> Yeah. And if two of you say yellow, then it's yellow. And if two of you or three of you say red, then it's red. But I don't know, because then the VAR is then officiating the game rather than the match referee. Yeah. And I think situations like this are ideal to go to the monitor and say, did you see what we've seen? Mm -hmm. And if you go to the monitor and you still say, yes, I, I believe it's a yellow card, then so be it. We have to accept that. That's the match referee. But yeah. if the referee goes to the monitor, as we've seen in other uh, matches in the tournament, and they say, oh, and it's almost been immediate, hasn't it? It hasn't yeah. been, oh, can I see it for 10 minutes? They've almost seen it and thought, oh, I didn't see that. Yeah. And then changed the colour of the card. So I would still love the match referee to make the final decision. But situations like that are just go and have another look at it. You know, we think... We're not thinking you've made a clear or obvious error, but we've got an angle that is seeing something. If you, and if you saw it, you might change your mind. Yeah, I like that approach, which is like, hey, it's not a clear and obvious error, but we, we think you need to look at this again. Just have a look because we might. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. We've had times, and John, you must have had times in, in your games where, you know, you've given a decision, you've given a card, and just based on the reaction, all of a sudden, you get this feeling in your stomach thinking, oh, maybe I haven't seen it how everyone else has seen it. And just that approach or that idea would be cool. Hey, go. It, almost the, the referee, it would be interesting if the referee could say, oh, I'm going to, you know, uh, because I'm not quite sure what's just happened. But then we get into player reaction and, and people changing the referee's mind, etc. And that's probably not where IFAB want to go, but... That would be interesting if the referee could say, I think it's yellow based on my first view, but something doesn't feel right to me because we get this feeling in our stomachs, right? Do you, yeah, yeah. Do you get that as well? Yeah, it's not just me. That's good. Yeah. Um, where, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe I need to go and see this again. And that's maybe where you say, B.A.R., oh, help me out here. Let me go. <laughs> just give me, give me, I don't know what their processes are, et cetera. But, so, but overall, you know, so it seems like we're happy with the, the decision with Saka, but maybe IFAB could look into uh, an ulterior, uh, alternative kind of punishment that sits in between yellow and red, which is interesting. Um, and then there's the, um, the Grealish Jorginho challenge, we think is probably almost uh, in, in line with what we've seen with the rest of the tournament, right? But um, the one thing I want to say about the way the referees, at least... And I, I wonder if, if the Denmark incident didn't get as much attention that this game may have been refereed differently. Because I feel like the amount of attention that Sterling's challenge got in terms of, you know, a lot of people around Europe thought that was a soft penalty. N not even a penalty, right? Not even a soft penalty. It was a not a penalty. And that that may have changed the instructions to Bjorn Kuypers in this game. To, and it felt that way that it was like, Bjorn, anything, I want Stonewall everything. You know, there was a couple of penalty chat, uh, decisions that, in fact, I thought were maybe even stronger than the, the uh, a penalty shout than previous games that were just completely ignored. And I feel like, and, and maybe correctly so, but I feel like they raised the bar on what a foul was in this game. And mm. that, hey, if, if I'm going to give a yellow, everyone's going to agree that it was a yellow. And if, it was a, if I'm going to give a red, everyone's going to agree. If I give a penalty, everyone, you know, there's no 60, 40, 70, 30. I'm going to get to 80, 90 percent of, you know, that. And, and I don't I don't know if I mind that. You know, I, don't, I think that's quite a good way to referee games because I thought we saw a lot more flow, a lot more interest. I don't, I don't know. Do you guys agree or am I just waffling on in a different direction? <laughs> do you not think do you think the refereeing was different to what we've seen in previous tournaments? Yeah, if I can come in here first, John. Um, obviously, at a tournament, um, obviously for the for the Euros, we've got European referees uh, plus one Argentinian uh, yeah. by invitation. And if it was a World Cup or a Confederations Cup, 
club world championships and you've got referees from all over the world. And although there's one set of laws of the game, people do referee differently in their own countries. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to a tournament, you want, first and foremost, consistency. And yeah. so that's why the referees have a workshop in advance of the tournament. They probably turn up at the tournament five days before, if not a week before it starts, so that, again, they're getting that consistent message. And then there's review of the matches. So let's just say after a, a, you know, a number of matches or after the first week, then all the referees are there and um, the instructors will be informing them that, yeah, we like this, but we want to work on that. Yeah. So even if you haven't done a game in the first week, you're given instruction what should happen when you do referee. Mm -hmm. And I, I was looking back at, you know, um, the German referee, Britsch, had uh, a quarterfinal and a semi final, which is quite unusual. Mm -hmm. um, you know, both Danny and Bjorn um, had important games, and those three referees had the most games appointed in the tournament is that you're looking for consistency, but you're also looking to give out a message of what we want you to act upon if yeah. this was to happen in, like, you know, future games. And that certainly did happen. So consistency, number one, and adapt to the way that the teams are playing, that if you feel that there's um, a type of tackle or a tactic that's happening, this is how we're going to deal with it. And so that, that was really pleasing. Brilliant. John, what's your thoughts? I think that uh, very similar, but in terms of like different tournaments, I always think there's um, something that overshadows each tournament going into it. So, for example, this one was probably simulation. I can't think what the last one is, but there's always like one big topic that surrounds each tournament. And obviously this one's different. The game's moved on since Russia. Um, so... I think the officials have been great this year with everything when it comes to simulation, when it comes to red cards, they've been really consistent. It's probably the most consistent I remember them for, but it's mm -hmm. probably the first tournament that I've really like, concentrated on both sides of football in terms of officials and the, in, in England, basically. Um, but yeah, I always think there is one challenge or something that is overshadowed or is a, the main focus of a tournament. So it's quite hard to be like, oh, yeah, that's different from every year because every tournament has each and its own challenge that it has to overcome. And, and Phil, I, I think, and this is a, a question really, but because these referees have refereed in the Champions League this year and, and the Europa League, and they are also run by the UEFA Referees Committee and the team there, it's not like these are new people who've just been picked and put to, together you know they've had the ability to put in that consistency throughout the season whereas at the world cup it's slightly different where because you're getting referees from different confederations right all of a sudden some referees may come to the uh, fifa tournament and be getting completely new advice and stuff like that right so we're probably going to see a difference when it comes to the World Cup in Qatar, right? And we saw it in 2018. The refereeing was slightly different. And it's not to say it was it was worse. It was just different. There was it wasn't as consistent. Is that a fair kind of? Yeah, we, yeah. You when you think about the World Cup, the World Cup is to try and involve as many people from all over the world. Um, but unfortunately, not all those match officials are used to refereeing in Italy. Germany, Spain, Brazil, yeah. Argentina, England. Um, and, you know, just to have 50,000 people in a stadium might be new to them. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's, it could be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Whereas you would say that, especially with the um, European Championships, is that all the referees selected are involved in, you know, international matches, yeah. Champions League, Europa League matches. So the majority of players either know of or come into contact with those referees on a more regular basis mm -hmm. than if you was to send somebody halfway around the world and, and do a match where they've not, had no contact. And, and, and so I thought that the, the relationships on the whole between players and match officials was really good. And, and John, you mentioned about simulation. I think the other point about this tournament was that referees had to act on the crowding of referees or match officials. So if there was that mob 
you know, mob culture of going to an assistant referee or referee. I, I can't remember if that happened. Um, it seemed to happen as much as, like, I think as a whole, the tournament really demonstrated a lot of fair play, right? Like amongst yeah. the teams, there wasn't really a huge amount of um, uh, games where there was tons and tons of yellows. In fact, Kuipers had six yellows in this game, which I didn't realise until I looked back at the stats because it, it, six seems like a lot for, for that game. It didn't feel like there was six yellows. But um, uh, yeah, I, I thought the whole tournament demonstrated fair play. So shall we move into, I was going to say, should we do our top three moments from the tournament? But as we've been discussing, I've written down more than three. So <laughs> I'd love to go around the, the, the table and talk about our, our best moments from a refereeing standpoint that, that we saw from this tournament. Um, so I'm going to start off with, um, with, with, with something that m many people, and this is my smallest one. It was, it was, it was just something that I've seen uh, in the last couple of hours. Um, but it's a video of Michael Oliver at the uh, Euros final. He's in the stand and there is a, a music being blared out and he is singing along to the music. And it's so stupid, it, you, you might say, oh, that's unprofessional. To me, that video humanizes referees. We are basically just fans. Some may say we're the biggest fans because we, we put up with all the rubbish of going out and being a referee uh, or an assistant referee. And I just love that video because it, it did exactly that. It showed, wow, okay, this guy, yeah, he's a great referee, but he's also just a normal person singing along to the songs and is a football fan. So. That was one that I, I loved. And if you haven't seen it, just Google it and search it on, on TikTok it was. So, um, yeah, I, I like that. It was just something small and humanising. Um, John, you want to go next? Um, mine is quite similar to that, actually. Um, in terms of, like, social media and the pundits and stuff, like, the overall image of referees seems to be the best it's ever been, like... Ian Wright has been going on about how good they've been and Lineker has been going on about how good they've been. And on social media, people have been like, look, you've got to say credit where credit's due. The officials have been class and they have been. And it's nice for them to finally be recognised and there's been no real controversy. And even if there has been a red card, people have been like, but, this is, but he's had a great game so far, so he must be right. So yeah. like the overall image in refereeing this whole four weeks has been pretty top notch. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think actually we need to praise the fans and the pundits for actually taking the time to recognise that as well. It's not just, you know, the fact that the it has been great refereeing, but the fact that they've actually taken the time to, to mention it. Um, the only thing I will say on it, and it's just a little bit, bit of information, there's a lot of talk about, well, this needs to now, like, why can't the Premier League do this, right? Or, or that, or VAR works so good here and it doesn't. The only thing to note is at, in VAR in this tournament, there were four VAR officials. There was a main VAR and three additional VAR assistants, right? Um, looking at different things. Whereas in the in England and in most of the top leagues, there's only two. So they had two extra people. So that was why it was quicker. Um, and unfortunately, I just don't think there's resources available. There are down the pyramid if we can all be VARs, but there's not enough resources to be able to put that into... Uh, practice in m major top leagues there should be but there isn't so but phil go on your 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 picks for top things okay just I, go I, with one and we'll keep going around okay <laughs> well i have to commend itv for mm -hmm. having peter walton probably in a uh, a room with a number of monitors um when they needed a referee expert uh, opinion um which I think some time ago, you know, channels did have referees, but all that referees did would tell them what the law was. Yeah. Um, but they called upon Peter to give a referee opinion um, because quite often we hear commentators talk football talk rather than referee speak. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Peter was able to give opinions on penalties and red cards and things like that. Sometimes Maybe he sat on the fence because it just like us. Yeah. Was it yellow? Was it red? But at, at least there was that opinion there that, you know, referees aren't just about red cards. You know, if we can manage situations, then we can do. 
Um, so I thought that it was commendable of ITV to have a referee on standby for any comments or decisions on law. So I, I think that's a great one. I didn't put, I didn't write that one down. So that was a good one. Um, my one, my next one is going to be Descent. Um, I think we saw four, maybe, maybe five, four, five um, yellow cards for Descent while the ball was in play. So the referees stopped the game. Um, gave a yellow card for descent and gave an indirect free kick the other way, which is so rare, but sends the most positive message out for referees at our level because all of a sudden, you know, it's now being kind of, I don't want to say dealt with more appropriately, but kind of kind of that. <laughs> so it gives us the tool and the armory to, to be strong and, and do it uh, at, at lower levels. We talk about bad behaviour of players, um, and there are there are occasions where obviously they the players go way above and beyond what is acceptable on the pitch. But what we do has have as referees is tools in our armory. We can talk to the players, we can use the captains, we can talk to the managers, and we've got a yellow and red card. So we don't need to put up with abuse when we go out and referee. Uh, we have the tools available should we want to use them, and it's just about being brave enough. To, to try and stop it as early as possible. So um, I, I found that uh, was a great, um, that was one to me was one of the initiatives I felt UEFA instilled in the referees saying, just don't take it, just get it done with. And no one, no one complained about it. Um, so yeah. Any more, John? Um, mine's got to be the Mark Lollivar red card in the quarter final. Um, you know, English boy, like so cool, calm and collected when he gave it out, knew exactly what was going on, looked in control for like aspiring referees to see him do that in a Euro's massive game and look so sort of unfazed by it all was pretty cool. Oh, brilliant. And Phil, I know I'm going to save the anti-Taylor incident for you um, because I think that was, you're the best person to talk about that incident and we'll save that. Uh, have you got any others before we... Um... I didn't see every game for 90 plus minutes, but I saw the highlights of every game. And one of the things that I didn't see, so correct me if I'm wrong, was sometimes we we speak about the image of the game from the technical areas where managers are throwing down water bottles or kicking water bottles or, uh, you know, there's tactics that are just we don't want and I didn't see as I say I could be I could be wrong but I didn't see anything from the technical areas that warranted the referee coming over and saying who said or did that because again the message for grassroots football now is if, if you do hear or see something from the from the from the sidelines regarding the coaches the managers the subs but you don't know who did it uh, law now allows referees to say Either you tell me who did it or you as the head coach, you as the manager will receive the sanction. But yeah. I don't know. Did you see anything from the technical areas that uh, referees so have to deal with? I think you, you, that's a great point because normally the technical areas can get messy, right? I saw two incidents that weren't really bad, but the, I'll just mention them now. So I think the Russian manager uh, in one game had a bit of a... Um, uh, an, disagreement with the referee I think it was Leoz the Spanish referee who managed it in the way he manages he went over gave him a light kind of like a hug or like a, a pat yeah. and said, get on with it kind of thing so it wasn't bad but that was a good way of managing that situation and I think there was one yellow card for someone on the field uh, on the t uh, bench and I think it was Michael Oliver and I think it was after that red card John it was the Switzerland team and it was one of the assistant managers but again it wasn't hugely demonstrative that everyone would have seen it, but that was it. But you're right, in a tournament where there was 51 games, all high emotions and riding high, the, uh, the um, behaviour of the benches was, was great. You're right. Mm -hmm. um, so, no, perfect. Yeah, it felt like that, I, I said it earlier, the whole tournament was a real great um, kind of showcase of fair play. I've not seen a, a tournament like that. You know, even the red cards weren't weren't two-footed, 
bad challenges trying to break someone's leg. They were genuine attempts to play the ball in most cases, right? Um, so even the red cards weren't, there was no violent conduct as far as I'm aware. Um, so, so yeah, great. Um, can, I, can I ask you guys though, although it was really sad and it certainly affected me because I was watching it live, uh, when uh, Christian Eriksen fell to the floor in the game, yeah, I, I think that brought everybody together. Yeah. And that certainly sent out his own message to what's important in life. Yeah. And thereafter, you know, I was really pleased for Denmark to do really well in the tournament. Their fans, everybody was like, we've mentioned this, our second team was Denmark because we really felt for them. They yeah. had a really great team spirit. Um, and although I was saddened by what happened, is that I think that galvanised everybody as yeah. football fans. You know what? I think that's a great observation, right? Because it happened really early. I think it was the second or third day of the tournament, right? And um, yeah, it was, I think you're right. All of a sudden, everyone kind of woke up and were like, oh, hold on a minute. Yes, we're playing in a major football tournament, but actually there are more important things in life. And you're right. Maybe that sad incident as it was, did help the the rest of the tournament. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll never know, but it could be completely true. Mm -hmm. um, my next one, and it's um, another small one, but one of the performances of the tournament in terms of refereeing was Rapinelli from Argentina. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, a great uh, initiative, which uh, before the tournament was um, uh, launched was a swap between UEFA and CONMEBOL for a Spanish referee to go and do Copa America games and for an Argentinian referee to come and do some Euro games. And, and actually, he was probably one of the stars of the tournament from a refereeing standpoint. He definitely exhibited more South American refereeing traits, uh, very strong body language, um, and just uh, actually performed really, really well. I thought he could have been in with a shout for a latter stage game as well. I think that he did a uh, round of 16 or maybe a quarter final, I'm not sure, but um, was, was, was really impressive. So for someone to come, it was, it was very good preparation for him if he's going to the World Cup next year, right? Because all of a sudden he's managed to showcase his skills in a completely foreign um, competition that he would never have refereed any of these teams really before. Um, so that was pretty, pretty great. John, any more from you? Um, other than the anti Turner one, you've uh, covered all of them. All. <laughs> yeah, so then, Phil, probably the moment, in terms of refereeing, this was, in my opinion, the the major um, kind of uh, highlight. I don't want to say highlight, but it was the highlight from a refereeing standpoint. You describe talk through why you think it was um, such a such a important moment. OK, so uh, a referee at all levels has to have many attributes. Um, and one of them is um, awareness, you know, what's going on around me. Um, I always say to new referees and when I uh, tutor on referee courses that a referee's number one priority is player safety. Mm -hmm. And I think that in this match, it, it was really unfortunate it was a sad occasion it was you know everything was your worst almost nightmare what could happen but I think that Anthony led because he's the team leader of the match officials on the day but he he was exemplary in the way that he conducted himself and brought a conclusion to that game to make sure that Christian Eriksen was treated by the professionals, not mm -hmm. by him. You know, if we see somebody yeah. and we can do the FA course on cardiac arrest, and I know a number of people have done that, so that's brilliant. But to get the emergency services on straight away and to deal with that, then you have to deal with the UEFA match delegate and maybe the referee observer um, and, and they make the the end decision over when the match will be replayed. So my, my point is, is twofold. One, how to deal with a major situation. So referees out there, if a player was to break their leg or swallow their tongue or, or anything that we have to deal with, people look at referees a bit like a policeman stroke um, mm -hmm. 
first responder in that we've got all the answers. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't have all the answers, you put on the bravery that you do and that you're going to try and help people with the situation. But the second point for me is almost as important that they came back that day to continue the match. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how they managed to do that because that in itself is going to test you emotionally as well as physically. And we saw from Denmark themselves that they didn't play the remainder of the game like they did the first part, and that really affected them. So my message really to referees out there and and to commend Anthony is the resolve which he had and the boys had to complete that game later on that day was unbelievable. Um, and the nearest I could possibly come to that, although I don't feel it's the same, is I can remember being in Rome uh, uh, for a Champions League game, Roma against Real Madrid. Mm-hmm. And I'm waiting in the hotel that afternoon. And on the TV, I, I'm seeing an aeroplane crash into the Twin Towers in New York. Mm-hmm. And then obviously you see the second plane. And I'm watching this live and I'm thinking oh my God, I've got a match tonight. How am I going to deal with this? Is the match going to be on? Is it not going to be on? Uh, A number of games were cancelled, but our game in Rome went ahead. Um, And you do put like your game head on. You know, you do switch. It's almost like a light switch. Yeah, during the day I'm this person, but as soon as it comes to three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon or 7.45 midweek, for example, you do put your referee head on and you go into referee mode. Yeah. I can't remember much about the game, but I I know where I was on that day. Mm -hmm. And I suppose for Anthony and the team, they would have spoke together. They would have probably spoken to other people to make sure they was in the right frame of mind. Um, You know, nowadays mental well-being is high on everybody's priority and awareness list is that he could not have continued that game without being, you know, strong-minded. So I want to commend him and the, and the team for doing that. No, awesome. I think um, that is a great way probably to end our Euro special. Um, John, thank you for being part of this and, and organising everything and making sure we had all the clips and, and giving your insight. Um, Phil, a real special thank you to yourself for you know, being part of the the journey with us, talking through the incidents and giving your kind of history and background and, and insights from tournaments in the past. It was wonderful to hear. Um, to those listening, we hope you, one, enjoyed our, our podcast and our chats. You know, you probably won't agree with everything we said, but uh, definitely um, definitely hope hoping that we gave you an insight into just a way of thinking slightly differently about... Um, these incidents and and what referees are going to be thinking about as they as they give these uh, decisions. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the Euros. It wasn't to be for England, but uh, we go again in eighteen months in Qatar, and hopefully we'll uh, we'll be back uh, back stronger, as they say. So thank you very much, um, and take care. And we'll see you in a few weeks for our preseason podcast, and when we start again. Thank you very much. Bye. Cheers, guys. <laughs>